Hello, I'm Mark Pollitt, and welcome to uh, Introduction to Forensic Genres in Technical Communication for Forensic Scientists. This is Module 3, and it will be my pleasure to present this program. In this module, um, we are going to take a look at a concept called genre. And our objectives in this module are that you're going to be able to describe what uh, genre means uh, as it applies to writing forensic reports. You will learn uh, that for forensic genres are basically differentiated from one another by form and content and tone. You learn the structural components of the forensic report. You'll be able to recognize different sections of the forensic report by their construction and their tone um, and their content. And you'll be able to explain why each section of the report needs to have a different form, content, and tone. As I mentioned before, each module um, or correction, each section of a forensic report has a different purpose. And uh, because it has a different purpose, we need to write each section differently. And so in this program, we're going to look at how to actually write each of the sections. And we're going to look at it from a theoretical perspective in this module, and later on we're going to actually do uh, the various sections and we're going to work on how we write each section. But for right now, what we want to do is understand uh, what this notion of genre is and un understand why we would choose to use one uh, form or tone of uh, writing in one section as opposed to another. Um, as I say, later on we're going to look at each of these uh, and uh, uh, cover them in some depth. When you go to a bookstore, say Barnes & Noble or Borders, you look around and you see there's fiction and there's mystery and there's computer texts and there are magazines. You know what you want to read or what you're looking for by the kind of book that it is. And each of those books have certain characteristics. You know, for instance, the difference between fiction uh, and nonfiction. One we know is a made-up story, another uh, is, uh, is more definitive. Uh, we understand that we're looking for books in the history section, uh, that what we're uh, hopefully going to find is a factual account and perhaps some interpretation of things that happened uh, in the past. Whereas if we look uh, at uh, romance novels, uh, we're very often looking for a story uh, about uh, someone's uh, romantic uh, life. Those are called in the literary field genre. And uh, they are a way of referring to the, tot the totality of how uh, a book is not only written, but who it's written for and what the impact of that writing uh, has. Similarly, uh, you see different movies. There are everything from musicals uh, to adventure movies uh, to documentaries. Uh, and you expect to see things differently. Uh, and even within uh, uh, each of those categories, there are subcategories, for instance, film noir and uh, horror movies, etc. And so uh, they're just a way of talking about uh, a particular style and audience uh, for uh, a literary or uh, movie work. We can extend that notion into your everyday life. Um, when you are standing around talking to your friends, you talk to them differently than if you're talking to your boss or your parents. And you talk to your boss differently when you're providing him some information that he wants uh, than when you are uh, either getting uh, reprimanded for doing something wrong or conversely uh, are asking for a promotion or a raise. In a similar fashion, we need to write differently depending on who our audience is and what we're trying to accomplish. 
And that definition is what we are going to refer to in the forensic arena as a forensic genre. For purposes of this lecture, we're going to merely describe genres as different formats, styles, or tones that are designed for a specific purpose. Format meaning how it actually is structured. Are we going to use bullet lists? Are we going to use a narrative? Are we going to use charts? Are we going to use diagrams? Styles are ways in which you write, kind of the voice in which you write, the difference in the way that you, uh, you write uh, to your boss or you write to a friend. And the tone is what you're trying to emotionally connect uh, with the, the reader. Um, in forensic reports, we want to make sure that we communicate the right things at the right time in our reports uh, and other communications. And we want to make sure that we're being effective uh, for our clients who are lawyers, their juries, and other forensic examiners. And so it's important for us to look very clinically at how do we write and how can we be most effective at communicating the, the vast number and different things that we have to, to uh, communicate and in some cases the very uh, rich complexity of the things we have to communicate. In the real world, uh, every organization has its own format for writing reports and other documentation. And so we're not going to use any particular organization's format here. But all of the reports have a couple things in common, and that is that they all need to tell why are we doing an examination, how did we do the examination, what is it that we found, and why those findings are important. We talk about these things or speak to these things in different ways. And each of the things that we're trying to get across, each section, is going to be a separate genre of how we talk about and how we write about uh, the particular elements that we're going to discuss. So it's important for us to make our words match what we're trying to accomplish. And one of the ways we can do that is by actually structuring the actual report in a way that tells a story. In our program, we have come up with our own format uh, for all of our forensic classes. And as I say, it isn't any particular organization's format, but it represents uh, a wide range of formats. And it is also designed to some degree as a teaching tool. There are things that we will include in our forensic reports in this class that will not normally be done uh, in the outside world, but it's designed to not only help you learn how to write like a forensic scientist, but also how to think like a forensic scientist. And in the following slide, you're going to see the overall format. We're going to take it uh, a slice at a time uh, as we go through this lecture, and of course we'll be working on this for the next several weeks. As you can see, this is a uh, format, and uh, notice that under the laboratory report, you're going to put the uh, class number, uh, CET, whatever the, the number of the particular class is. Uh, the laboratory number, that is the number that's assigned uh, to the particular exercise or laboratory examination that you conduct. Most laboratories have a very uh, structured system of assigning numbers and very often those numbers have uh, a significant meaning uh, so you will learn those uh, when you uh, work in a sp specific laboratory but for the purposes of this class the laboratory number will be the one uh, listed in the tasking that you receive. Obviously the date is the date that you complete the, the laboratory report, the examiner's name, uh, hopefully you know that, and uh, the next block down below uh, has some uh, possibilities there. It can be an exercise, a validation test, or an examination. And so you should only use uh, one of those three terms uh, for uh, the particular uh, exercise. Uh, and likewise that will be given to you uh, in the tasking uh, in each class. Below the bold line are the sections of the laboratory report examination or validation tasking, uh, forensic questions, steps taken, results, conclusions, and opinions. The first section is called the tasking. 
and this is basically what whomever assigned you to conduct whatever investigation or examination that you are working on, uh, what do they tell you to do? And what is your authority to act? And what are the limits of your authority to act? Uh, are there things that you're allowed to look for or not look for? Um, what did they ask you to do? What are their investigative or prosecutorial goals in having you conduct this examination? Obviously, this is your starting point, and if it contains limitations, then you are prohibited from going beyond those limitations by law. But within those limitations, you have a great deal of latitude in how you construct your examination. And so your goal is to start with enough raw material uh, in terms of the tasking for you to understand what it is that they want done so that you can then create an examination plan which will allow you to conduct your examination as efficiently and as effectively uh, as you can. It is in a sense a restatement of your examination goals from your plan except that this actually comes first so it is somewhat of an iterative process as you are accepting the tasking or as you're communicating to your client who's giving you this tasking until you understand what it is that they want in enough detail that you understand what you need to do in terms of creating an examination. It very much serves to frame what you're doing in connection with the examination. Frame in the sense that it's putting limitations on it, but also it's telling you the nature of what it is that you're trying to do. You have to write this uh, section so that you and anyone else that reads it understand clearly exactly what it is that you're trying to do and that that objective is, the, the goal is objective, meaning that it is nonpartisan. Most people don't spend enough time or effort on writing this section. It's really important to do that for one reason, to ensure that you can defend whatever it is that you did in court uh, because it is legally appropriate and it is forensically appropriate. Uh, but you also need to work on this for another reason far more personal. And that is it ultimately tells you when you are finished with your examination. Experience teaches us that it's a lot easier to start an examination than it is to stop one, to finish one. Ultimately, when you get into the examination, you find that there are lots of things that you could do in addition to what you initially set out to do. And so the tasking allows you to know when you've done enough, and it puts a limit on how much examination you do on each piece of evidence. This will become very important to you in the real world. And as you can see, it is... Uh, the very first uh, part of the forensic report and we'll show you an example of uh, what uh, some of them might look for, look like. In this particular example, uh, Detective Jones uh, from the Tulsa Police Department gave you a hard drive and uh, he also gave you a copy of the search warrant which is your legal authority to conduct your examination and that search warrant only authorizes you to look for information concerning the manufacture, possession, distribution of controlled dangerous substances in violation of that particular statute by a subject named Roger Marks. He provided you with a summary of the case so you have some investigative context, context and then Detective Jones requested an examination be conducted to identify a number of things. In this particular case, notice that the style of writing is narrative. It is very clinical. It is very objective. Uh, it is very logical. Each section flows from the, the, the previous one. And uh, clarity is one of the major goals here. And so uh, that kind of gives you the notion of how you want to write these things. And this is the tasking genre. The forensic question section is uh, unique to uh, an educational setting. You will not typically see these uh, in the real world. We include them because they provide a really important 
teaching purpose. One of the ways in which you have to begin to think about designing your forensic examinations is by trying to discern what kinds of questions you're trying to answer. Inman and Rudin in their textbook came up with a typology for this uh, and they call it identification, classification, individualization, association, and reconstruction. Now these are the subject of an entire lecture uh, in the basic forensic science class, uh, but just as a refresher here, identification is questions where you're trying to determine what something is. Is this white powder, powder cocaine? Is this body in fact uh, John Smith? Um, did this, uh, uh, is this in fact a Smith & Wesson revolver? Classification and individualization on the other hand are a continuum. In classification we're trying to determine the origin of something uh, and what limits can we place upon that origin down to individualization where we are saying that this is identical to a known to the exclusion of all others. As an example, a fingerprint uh, by itself may be classified as a loop, a whirl, etc. But if we can match it to a known uh, print, then we can say that the latent print found at the scene is in fact uh, the, or the source of which is the person who has the known print and therefore uh, this latent print was left by the individual with the known print to the exclusion of all others. That is individualization. You know, sometimes here it called class and individual evidence. Association are questions where you're trying to put people or things in contact with one another. It can be everything from hairs and fibers that are left uh, at a crime scene or taken away from a crime scene uh, to electronic connections between uh, email and networks uh, and data. The last area is reconstruction and this is where you are basically trying to figure out the sequence of events that led up to a particular outcome and in so doing you're able to define what the sequence of events was and the order and timeliness of them. In this particular section the tone is very intellect analytical and very proscriptive. You are trying to fit your questions into one of these four uh, areas and you have to uh, figure out which area is appropriate and how to word the question that needs to be answered in that context. Once you have done that you end up with a sentence that tells you what kind of examination you need to do. As an example, right, we have here four forensic questions. And you can see that our genre is to use uh, uh, sentences uh, and bullet points and very succinct uh, but very logical and objective pr uh, prose. Uh, for instance, question one is identify, a question of identification. All emails to or from Joe Dokes. Second one is determine if there are any files identical to those found in connection with another piece of evidence. In this case, we're, we're looking to individualize evidence. Associate the use of this particular computer, a compact presario, um, with uh, a particular person, Simon Says. And then the last one is reconstruct the sequence of any communications between Joe Dokes and Simon Says. The next se section, uh, steps taken, um, seems like it ought to be really simple and really straightforward but like so many things in forensic science, it's not. As forensic examiners, we have to document everything we do. And so, in a lot of ways, the core documentation that we utilize are our examiner notes. And we must document everything that we did there. But the report is ultimately designed for a customer. And that customer doesn't need to know everything that you did, and particularly doesn't need to know 
the things that you did that doesn't matter with respect to the outcome. So the steps taken for starters is a subset of your universe, the everything that you did. But it also has to provide enough information so that everything that follows after it makes sense. If you think of the report as mirroring the forensic process where we have our beginning point of our tasking and our planning stage uh, for the forensic questions and then this is where we actually do things the product of this is going to be our results and from that results we're going to come to conclusions and ultimately some forensic opinions. Each of the steps builds on the next. So you will have com completed the examination before you actually write the steps taken. So the, what you need to do is to figure out what do I need to put in the steps taken that will outline in general what I did with the investigation and will account for all of the things that I found and will produce in my results section or in the appendices and upon which in turn my conclusions and the opinions are based upon. Looking at it yet another way, if you have an opinion there must be a conclusion which supports it. The conclusion must have results upon that you can then rely on to, to create the conclusion and the results have to come from a step taken. So uh, it's a little tricky. It's trickier than it looks. It's important to kind of outline how you did this. Uh, I find that if you actually create it in a logical path uh, with subsections and then you can fill in the individual steps uh, that create uh, the, the factual basis for all of the uh, things that you need at the end. Um, it's done as a list of bulleted steps but it uses complete sentences including periods. Those sentences need to be in a narrative form. It's also a little tricky because while the tone has to be clear and you have to be very objective about what you say and it has to be very succinct, it has to be readable and that's even more difficult when you are very often talking about very technical things. And so one of the ways in which you can deal with that is to make sure that your first sentence in each step uh, is very clear and, and very unambiguous to the non-technical reader and then you provide the technical detail in the end of that sentence or in the follow-on sentences within that particular step. Another thing that is very useful is when you are talking about a software command or a piece of software um, that you can utilize something like uh, italics uh, to offset that uh, so it is not misinterpreted as uh, part of the narrative. Um, make sure that you do not put any uh, specific results in this section. You can say that there were so many hits or something along those lines but you should not be putting the actual content uh, of your results in the steps taken. It is just that a listing of the important steps that you have taken that will support your subsequent uh, results, conclusions, and opinions. We see an example here. Again, it is a bulleted list or a set of numbers and uh, we are uh, going to uh, put one or a couple sentences in each one and they flow from top to bottom. Note that uh, I put in here, do not put in screenshots uh, or, uh, or the content uh, of, uh, of files that are found for digital forensic examinations here. Uh, those properly belong in the results uh, section or in appendices. Here's a, an example, um, a, working for, uh, a forensic working copy. The original evidence was made using dd.exe. Uh, I would uh, suggest that you put the dd.exe, which we understand as a, as a program, in italics. Uh, in the MD5, some values of the original duplicate were verified to be my 
Now you may not understand uh, as a layman exactly what that means, but you can understand from that sentence that there's an original and a duplicate and they were both uh, verified to have the same value. A new case was opened in Forensic Toolkit version 1.2 and the Im image was indexed. Uh, a review of the this file system was conducted um, and that should have a period at the end of that sentence by the way. Uh, known non-pertinent files were eliminated using FTK's known file filter and the National Software Reference Library uh, hash list. Results of the uh, a search for the following string, strings was conducted with the following results and all you're doing there is you're telling them what strings you look for and uh, in general that you had some results. Um, then you, you have the disposition of the evidence. Each of the data identified in five was examined for metadata and exported to a CD-ROM for review so that the reader knows, okay, you had a positive result and uh, here's where uh, to look for those results. And an examination of the internet history and cache was conducted. Uh, you probably would want to include a lot more uh, in this particular section for this examination, but I just wanted to give you a brief example uh, and you can see the logic behind it. And again, the, the tone of it uh, is, uh, is very objective. Uh, it is very procedural. Uh, think about it in terms of this is a cookbook, uh, but you're only putting in the things that are important to the actual recipe. The last three sections, uh, or particularly this section, uh, tends to get confused with the steps taken and in turn it gets a little confused with the last two sections, conclusions and opinions. So a lot of people struggle with the results section. If you think about it in terms of the steps taken reports the raw data and, and I, I mean that not in terms of actual output but that there is data. I, Results, on the other hand, takes that raw data uh, and actually provides it in a, uh, in a format that allows you to do something with it. Whether that means print it out, whether that means create a chart, whether that means create a, a graph. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is to communicate what the, the outcome was of your uh, steps taken. This uh, is a far more complex task uh, from a writing perspective than the other ones are, uh, but in some ways it's actually easier uh, to do. Um, you have a lot more flexibility in this section. While it needs to be in narrative form, uh, you and, and all the data has to be supported by your, uh, your notes and your printouts and, and that sort of thing as well as your steps taken, you have the opportunity to organize it in whatever logical fashion you think and that you may include uh, things like tables and charts and in some cases screenshots but only if they are evidentiary in value. Um, and then the uh, it's important to understand that this is the meat of uh, your report and it is very important that you uh, report the results in a way that people understand uh, what they are so that they will then in turn understand your conclusion and, and your opinions. And <clears throat> obviously this is where it goes in the report um, and uh, there's a brief example there uh, but here is a, a much more uh, in-depth one. And notice that while these are numbered, uh, you do not have to number your results and uh, many people uh, find that it's actually more effective not to uh, because you really uh, want to control the narrative flow a little bit better. Uh, but uh, you can see that the way this is worded, the sentences are longer, um, they are uh, constructed much more descriptively uh, and uh, they are developed uh, into themes. You see that in this directory, um, a series of files collectively uh, uh, which constituted a website were located and then uh, when you looked at them in the browser, they uh, uh, were advertising the sale of, uh, of chemicals used for uh, cocaine processing 
that the site was developed using uh, Microsoft Office Publisher, uh, which you also found installed on the hard drive. And here you're taking two uh, or three disparate pieces of information and putting it together. They're all factual, but you're, uh, you're putting them together so that the reader understands why having those three things uh, are important. Um, and uh, then you're doing your association part of, of, uh, of associating it with Roger Mark. So in a single paragraph, you've actually uh, done three of the four uh, fronts of questions. Uh, the second one is a review of the recently used files and Microsoft Office reveals the locations and names of five of the files which were included in the above website. So now you've done a, a, an additional association uh, for this particular case. Conclusions. Um, this is where it really becomes a little tricky. Um, in the end, conclusions are what you absolutely positively and scientifically can prove just within the four corners of what you see in your examination. You should not, under any conditions, make what I call investigative conclusion, and that is you really ought to go out and interview Joe Dokes, or you really ought to go look for something else. Uh, that's not the purpose of a forensic examination. Uh, all you know is that based upon the results that were found, this is what I can conclude to a scientific certainty. The facts are a set of a, uh, are conclusions, whereas opinions are based in part on experience. Uh, doesn't matter if you're the newest examiner on the block or the oldest examiner on the block, but you should have no difficulty in demonstrating a conclusion. Both of those uh, rely on facts that are uh, observable to both the new guy and the old guy. Whereas opinions can be based uh, on experience. Uh, if the examiner is, uh, has got 20 years of experience and has looked at thousands of these and in, in virtually every case a certain set of uh, circumstances has, uh, has prevailed, then she can say that uh, based upon my experience there is a high likelihood that this is the situation uh, based upon thousands of, of, uh, of prior experiences. That's the, the big break point between conclusions and opinions. Right? When you're stating your conclusions, the tone has to be definitive. It should be very clear. This is what I am saying. But it has to be logically developed and logically demonstrated. And so uh, this is, uh, again, how you have to construct your conclusions very differently from uh, your uh, steps taken or your results. And again, this is where it goes in the report. And uh, here is a conclusion example. Based upon my comparison of the website files located in that location with those located online, the two sites are identical. Okay, that's a, a statement, it is a fact. I know they're identical. And you go on to explain why you know they're identical. This conclusion is based upon the file names, sizes, mathematical signatures, and a direct comparison of the individual files. You're saying that you did your homework. You looked at them, you uh, did uh, uh, hash values on them, uh, and you know that these are, in fact, identical. And so that is a scientific conclusion. Opinions, on the other hand, are based upon facts, but uh, are not absolute and require the use of the examiner's experience. As a result, you need to describe them very logically in your narrative in a way that is persuasive. And in many cases, you also have to persuade the reader why your particular experience would indicate that. If you have done many of these same sorts of examinations before, and you have seen this in many cases, then you can say that. Uh, and you need to say that in order to support your opinion. If this is the first time you have ever seen this before, it's probably not appropriate for you to form a scientific opinion. You can report your conclusions, which you can demonstrate, but as to opinions, you may not have one 
if you have very limited or no experience. Your word choices, tone, and sentence structure are really critical here. And they're critical because attorneys live in the world of words. And so while your conclusions may be uh, scientifically demonstrable, your opinions are at least in some degree just that, your opinions. And how you communicate that opinion right, is going to be dissected when you're up on the stand. And that's why uh, choosing your words and the tone and the structure are really important. It has to be persuasive, but at the same time, it cannot be absolute. If it's absolute, it's not an opinion. If it's an opinion, it shouldn't be absolute. Again, here's where it goes, and an example. Based on the examination of the subject's computer, the computer's internal clock, the dates and times of the email files located on the subject's computer, the connection logs to the subject's internet service provider provided by the investigator, and the email message received from the cooperating witness also provided by the investigator. It is my opinion that the subject's computer is most likely the source of the email received by the cooperating witness. What you have done is laid out all of the facts that you have relied upon and based upon that, you have uh, come to a likely conclusion. Now, those of us that have done this for a while realize that that's about as good as it's ever going to get. And so, as a result, this is a very strong opinion, but uh, it is very well founded. And so, you need to kind of scale your uh, subjective opinion based upon the strength of the evidence and the strength of your uh, prior experiences uh, with uh, similar uh, case situations.